you can get pizza. Like if you want industrial design, you can get industrial design, but do you want the Lunchable as your pizza? <laughs> and if you do, yeah, maybe you do. Like maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you're designing a kazoo and Lunchable pizza is fine for that. But say you're designing like a, a next generation webcam or a next generation smartwatch. I think you might want something a little more sophisticated. So this is Odd Engineer episode number eight. We're here with Tristan Kanan. He's an industrial designer and he's the first industrial designer on the podcast. Welcome, Tristan. Thank you for being here. So good to be here. Thanks for having me, Erin. So excited to talk to you. So as the first industrial designer, you have to walk us through how you got to where you are. Tell us about your education. Uh-huh. Way, way back. <laughs> way back. Okay, cool. Yeah, I um, I think where most industrial designers end up is in one of two two camps and it all starts in high school usually where you're high either, school yeah high school yeah I was talking to someone at the dog park about this today because a lot of times people like uh they ask me what I do and I say industrial design and they say what was your major and I say industrial design <laughs> to me that's like a really kind of straightforward question but then you get the folks in marketing or business who can choose whatever to do and for for us we kind of either have to decide when we're like 18 or when we eventually find out about it kind of later in life, which is also um, where a lot of industrial designers come from, whether they've done engineering or urban planning or graphic design or illustration. And then they find out about this profession and want to come back into the fold and um, be industrial designers. But yeah, so I found out about it in high school with my art teacher. I was doing a lot of charcoal drawings In art class, wow. In art class, yeah, uh uh-huh. Yeah, I went to um, school in upstate New York in high school school there. We're both from upstate New York? I had no idea. I didn't know either. Where are you from? I'm from Rochester. No, I'm from Rochester. Get out of town! (laughs) That's wild. Um, We're homies. Yeah, no freaking way. I'm from Webster, specifically. I'm from Greece. Oh, that's why we never met. uh Uh-huh. Uh huh. Wow, which grease? Because there's quite a few. The dirty part. <laughs> I went to Olympia High School. Okay. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I I wouldn't. I I dirty didn't come to mind. See, when I think of Greece and your Greece Athena, Greece Odyssey, Greece Olympia, there's Arcadia. There's one more, Arcadia. Yeah, I just think of all the Greek mythology, and in my mind. Y'all are over there, like in in togas, doing something with thunder or something. <laughs> Dirty doesn't come to mind. Just maybe more majestic comes to mind. But that's so cool. So, so yeah. that so that yeah. makes a lot more sense to me then, because um, you know when I went to college, one of the the big things why they wanted to recruit me was not my SAT scores. It wasn't that I had straight A's. They're like, oh, you got a Regis diploma in New York. That's a big deal. So and I and I was also I was going to be an artist in high school. So I, I did the art track and I know like we, we have really good art education in New York. So I, I understand yeah. where you're coming from. This is awesome. Okay. That is so, cool. That kind of explains a lot too. I've heard uh, Rochester people find each other. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> they kind of, yeah, it's something. And then, and then either you're sucked yeah. back or you find each other out in the wild. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been working with that for a while. We were thinking about going back to Rochester, but we're in, we're in Salt Lake city now. Yeah, um, my wife and her parents just moved here, and my brother and sister in law live here. So we're we're having fun over here, and I'm I'm kind of newer here. I've been here for a year and a half, and before that I was in San Francisco. Um, so it's kind of a, a new area, but maybe we'll get into this later. But it's been interesting to have to start to build up my connections here and right. uh, make that work as a freelancer because it is it is a factor that I hadn't thought of, especially in the age of everyone being remote. But um oh back to back to the question yeah um, uh, yeah I was an art kid and then I went to RIT for for industrial design and oh. then there were folks who were like interested in building things so not everyone came with an art background but um yeah while I was there I had a a quick internship in China um through- oh, wait let me just interrupt um, you real quick yes. I think huh? Kyle Kyle Visner also went to RIT did you know that no this is. Big news. We all have the Rochester connection. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So you're saying? <laughs> Ooh, no, no. Um, yeah. So I, I had some internships in college, and they all kind of led to another thing 
Whenever right, because RIT is a co-op, a co-op school, yeah. so you get to do the work. While yeah, you're going. Uh -huh. yeah, and and it's not a requirement for us. I know it is at some schools, but I was just, oh. I was, I was lucky and kind of was in the right place at the right time for these opportunities. And that internship led to an internship with Motorola, and then I was in the Bay Area, and then um, I went back to RIT for a year to finish up my degree, and then graduated, and then potentially looked a attractive as someone who had a few tech internships to a consulting firm in the Bay Area that did a lot of tech. And so wow. that, was my, that was my trajectory and it all kind of built up on it on itself. So yeah, and our field thanks. Yeah, I was I was lucky and everything seemed to line up real nice. So what and, kind of work were you doing in the uh, internships? Was it real work? No, no. no. That would that would have been that would have been amazing. I think the most real thing I did was create dimple patterns for a a Motorola like headphone thing. Um, and did that, you have to like individually make the dimples all the way around. No, we used we used computers. <laughs> no, we yeah we we uh, yeah it was we made some textures in in Illustrator and and stuff. But but it it was nice and it was cool too because all those. Motorola folks um, went on to do wild things at, at Google later. So at one point I was always thinking, wow, it'd be so cool to work at Google. And I'm sure it is, but I'm a little bit less in that camp now, but still- Because we're older. <laughs> yeah, yeah, older and, and wiser. have- Wiser. Yeah, wiser, maybe some pets, maybe some other <laughs> life goals. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's where I went. And then after the consulting for a few years, I went out on my own doing some contracts and for the past three and a half years or so, I uh, have been doing that and having a lot of fun. Yeah. Cool. So was that difficult to go from, you know, a place where the work was brought to you versus trying to find it on your own? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was at first. And when I first jumped off, it, it everything had kind of for all my career just been lining up and coming coming my way, which was neat. And then to to go straight into a contract for close to a year. And then with, with coronavirus um, emerging around that time in 2019, my contract got put on pause. And so I was without work for a few months and I hadn't done any marketing. So that was an interesting revelation to, uh, have, to yeah, have to start a, <laughs> from kind of like from, from scratch to develop these client connections. And then, and then that all seems to be how it's been going for me for the past few years, like uh, slowdowns and then buildups and slowdowns. So something that I do need to do is just get a grip on um, the consistency of, of consistent marketing and uh, then consistent work, which I feel like you do really well. You're always, you're always going out there and, and being a, being a, a source of knowledge for folks. And then I imagine that just allows the clients to, to see you and, and find you whenever they need you. Yeah, you have to constantly remind them that you exist because it's not enough to just make a connection. Like I remember yeah. when I got back in touch with Kyle Visner, who we were just talking about, and I was like, oh, there's someone who needed an IoT guy. And I knew that I had one in my network and I forgot it was you. And I was like kicking myself. And then I couldn't remember who it was after that. Uh -huh. um, but that's why you need to constantly remind the people that you've already made connections with that you exist, uh -huh. even uh -huh. if it's not like, a value add thing that you might be posting on LinkedIn or whatever, just be like, it's me, Tristan, remember me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, an and, industrial designer yeah. and it's me. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like anytime uh, I, I should, I just, I realized you sent me your book a little while ago and I haven't read it yet, but that's been on my list for the past few weeks. And so that's exactly cool. why I, I have it at like $25 because uh -huh, uh -huh if I give it away for free, because it's, it's not like a five page thing. It's like 80 pages. Yeah. I knew that people wouldn't read it unless like they have that. What is it called? Like, uh, um, I don't know. It's an economic concept when you're like losing money versus gaining something and well, you're more inclined to like, Oh no, I'm going to opportunity. Cost? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> spitball economics terms. Yeah. No, yeah, I sunk cost, that. sunk cost, uh, uh, uh -huh. you know, kind of, sort of like that. So when you spend money on something, um, you're like, okay, I have to actually go through with this because it's, it's actually psychologically painful. It's the same as if you hurt yourself whenever you take money out of your wallet. So I actually, that was supposed to be a free guidebook originally, uh -huh. but then it was so big that I'm like, if I give this away for free, it's too big for people to read it. 
if I uh-huh. just give it away. So they need to pay uh-huh. for it so that they, I mean, how many books in college <laughs> would you have actually read all the way through if they didn't cost $300, right? Or you had a class where you actually Still had annoying. to like. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's really, that's a great, great point. And I've been kind of thinking about something like that too, because I've been opening up a, um, uh, a free ID workshop for, uh, it started a, a week ago and it's going to be going for the next 12 weeks. And so I have some 15 early professionals and students involved in it. And they're oh all so talented. Yeah. And so they all kind of have this, um, this, this drive to, to make neat stuff and they're all really friendly folks, but I'm wondering if I ever expand it, like, uh, how, how that works. Like, will someone, I guess this is a, a question for another time, but like how to, how to keep people invested in, in what they're doing and for, for their benefit maybe. And then of course, if you make some, some money in the process, it doesn't hurt, but we're trying to, <laughs> we're trying to help the world first of all. <laughs> so yeah. Tell me more about that. That's really cool. Is that online? Yeah, it's online and it's, it's a pilot right now, but what we're doing is we're, we're looking into these uh, emergency radios that exist on the market and yeah. trying to um, kind of maybe less invent a new product, but create, this is more of a, a, Let's see, there's a lot of industrial design courses that are very conceptual, uh, especially in school. And so I have a, a theory with the, some of the students I've talked to and worked with over the years that what would be really beneficial is to just make something that you could see on the market. So when a hiring manager or a client sees something similar to this radio, yes. they think, oh, okay, yeah, like this is, a, this is a, a, a product that I can sell versus maybe something that's uh, really out in the clouds and, and no one's ever seen before and will never be on the market, but it proves that you're, you're clever and that you can think a certain way. That's valuable, but I think maybe the most valuable thing for ID folks this, in this day and age is to have something that has that, that draft we were talking about before and has um, some good sensibility around plastic molding and usability uh, and then some nice styling. And and so this feels like a really good canvas to, to do that with, uh, whether you do something that looks rugged and kind of dynamic like this, or something that maybe fits more in line with a, a Sonos product or an Apple product. Uh, so that's that's where we're going. And it's, it's still kind cool. of early. We'll see where it goes. Yeah, I'm super stoked. Oh, and you're going to like yeah. this. We're going to hopefully, at least my project will, because I'm doing the project too, but we're going to do illumination as well. So we're going to yes. have LEDs. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that'd be a cool thing. If you, if you ever, uh, we can talk about it later, but like, I uh, would love to collab. Yeah. Oh, cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, telling people about, about this, this world that you live in that a lot of us, um, maybe don't find out about until it's too late and our products light up and they don't do anything that we intended them to do. So that would be so cool. So yeah. are, are your students then like uh, actually having the physical thing or would this just be the drawings of it that they can display? This would be, this this flushes out the entire process. So rather than just being a, a workshop more so of, of doing maybe sketches and then CAD and then renders, we're actually starting from the beginning, which is usually where I start with most clients, where we're doing a, a strategy phase and we're looking at the context, we're looking at the users, we're looking at the competition, similar products, the aesthetic direction in which we can go because there's a zillion, zillion directions you can go. And so what that strategy phase gets us is rather than looking at 360 degrees of this, this product, which could go in any direction, we, we minimize it to maybe some 50 or 60 degrees. And now, so you know, you can go in this direction and then there's there's a few more phases where we keep uh, whittling that direction down until we find the one uh, the one solution that fits the criteria that we developed. And so that's what I'm taking them through. Rather than just making something, I'm trying to give them a toolkit of process that is directly what I give my clients as well. Wow, I didn't realize that you do all of that background research in your work and with your clients. That's amazing. Thanks. Thanks. And there is, there is that version of it where it is research, where maybe you're, if you're working on some medical product, you go into a hospital and you, you watch people use 
certain things or see how they react to certain things. You do that ethnographic type research where you go into someone's house and see how they use a vacuum. That's that's not often too much what I do rather. I do more strategizing where I'm trying to narrow the scope as much as possible through each phase to arrive at something that that we can say without a doubt, this is a good solution. Um, right. But investigating yeah. the market, existing products, mm -hmm. the user base, like that's in-depth stuff that a lot of, I know, hardware startups don't pay too much attention to and, and they mm -hmm. really should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and if if only to just uh, find yourself in in a place of, of progress, because if you can do that, you can just start to, like I was saying, narrow the scope and and make make efficient movements versus lobbing a product idea out there and then taking a step back because oh no like I, this thing needs to go outside and we didn't make it waterproof <laughs> we have to start over so like establishing that criteria which is even beyond like just a standard brief can be super helpful and and very like uh risk reducing even that's great to know that you are experienced in that and comfortable with doing those steps and you're not just, see, this is the difference between like an expert service provider and someone that you hire to fill a seat in your organization because they don't have an industrial designer. One is going to come in with all this extra um, experience and oversight and actually, no, don't do it this way. Maybe do it this way. And the other person's going to be like, what do you want? Just tell me and then I'll do it. And then I'm out. And then I, then I put my time card in, stamp it, and then I'm gone. You know, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. totally different approach. And yeah. you're definitely That's the impossible. expert. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's nice being a partner to clients. And it's nice, you and I both share the same um, pain points of sort, where it's, uh, we like being involved in, in the process early on to the end of the, the, the project, because our kind of professions are these, this glue that kind of holds the whole um, development process together. And so when you just utilize us for a few months at a time and you don't give us that uh, freedom to work up front and the freedom to um, see that intent through to production, it's it's a little bit um sad, but maybe yes. a little bit wasteful as well. Yeah. And I think um, you also have on your on engineer profile, you have like a um, introductory meeting that people can schedule like a zoom call. So I have that too. So if anyone is thinking about an industrial design project, they should get in touch with you. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, right yes. in the beginning. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's like a funny thing too. Like, uh, this, this follows the same, same thread, but like being, being involved in the, in the project is, is like really pretty, pretty easy I think so if a client wants to start a product and they're not they're not even ready for engineering or design just dropping us a note and and being a sounding board to them can be kind of super helpful in helping them make some steps whether it's um for example we want to make a security camera and the security camera goes on a on a post yeah like it goes on a post and you uh Put it in your office space and then they give us that brief and then we're like wait 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 why are we why are we putting on it on a post like let's just mount it to the wall and they've like already spent time developing this uh, this stand that it goes on i just this yeah. is completely completely made up but um something <laughs> like that where like you kind of like miss the user experience that your clients or your customers are actually looking for Mm -hmm. And you project something that might be true for some users, and maybe it's true in your mind. <laughs> but like, there's there's some some simple steps that we can go through to to validate this and to just put all the cards on the table and and pick from those. And so, yeah, I would I would love it if like a a client just came to me and and said like, ten years from now, I want to do this. <laughs> and yeah longer the better or yeah you know, like maybe a few months or, or so that that's nice. that's great I love how you you always put everything so delicately and like kindly and you're so I don't know you're very um what is the word 
emotionally competent engineer i would be like thanks Aaron. yeah the only person who's going to do this is the imaginary one in your mind holding it on a stick no one wants to do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. So let's yeah. go. I want to go through like your profile and auto engineer a little bit. Yeah. And I love, love, love that you have all these pictures of past projects because like you were just saying, like for your students, you know, you want them to have visual representations of things that they can do because that's how clients decide on them as their person. And you have that. And, and I know from, from my own profile, people go on it and they're like, Oh yeah, I thought that my my thing was a lot like an automotive rear combination light. So that's why I chose you. And I'm like, wow, your thing is nothing like a rear combination light on a Corvette. But <laughs> but okay, glad that you made that connection. So yeah. the more the more pictures that you can have, and you have a lot, uh, I think the better because you never know what kind of connections people are gonna make in their minds between what they're working on and what they see. And they don't read words. They don't. <laughs> Uh-huh. They totally yeah. don't read words. But you have a lot of um consumer electronics. You got like Roku on here. You've got mm -hmm. um an iPhone attachment. You've mm -hmm. got a luminaire, which I love to see because I'm an illumination designer. And what is this? Is like a thermos? Oh, it's a what is that? Burrito pop. It's a it's a project I worked on at burrito uh, a burrito, burrito pop. pop? Burrito pop. Yeah. You might be familiar. The the folks at Informal, Nate and Sam and Bernadette. Um, oh, had, Informal. Had, yeah. They had a client um, named Madeline Woods come to them probably two or three years ago now. Maybe more. Time moves very fast sometimes. And so Madeline Woods had this idea some eight years before where she was coming back from her lunch and her burrito would just sit in a mug on her desk and uh, she would was looking for a more elegant solution to uh, specifically eat burritos. And so her idea was to take this um, elevator that went inside a twistable elevator. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, yeah it's, it's like a, it's a very niche. It might be the most niche thing I've ever worked on, but it's really nice and enjoyable uh, and, and kind of cool. And so, yeah, so I did, I did the industrial de design on this. Sam Holland did the mechanical engineering. Michael Turwent did some of the growth work and there were, there were a bunch more involved. Elizabeth Goodspeed doing the, the graphics and the branding and such. And then of course, That's Madeline so Woods nice. leading the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really fun. And That's yeah, so cool. A burrito thermos. You are correct. It is a thermos, <laughs> but maybe not for your... <laughs> the food or beverage you had in mind. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, so under your specialties, you have consumer electronics industry and you have a lot of pictures of those types of things in your profile, injection molded plastics, which you just mentioned, um, manufacturing industry, because it's good to understand um, when you're designing for something that's going to be like a higher volume manufactured good versus a one-off thing where tolerances don't matter, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you need to think about draft angles and stuff because it's going to be injection molded. Um, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. also have medical industry as a specialty. Have you worked on medical mm -hmm. products? I have. I, I got to contract with a studio in San Francisco called Y Studios. And, and the leader of the studio did all the original Sonos work. And now he does some great work with his own specific clients. And so he had a client that um, came to the studio doing some pharmaceutical packaging and so I got to work with them for maybe close to a year on developing this this experience this out-of-box experience which contained uh a few different steps and I'm, I'm being very careful not to divulge too much as I'm sure you're familiar <laughs> but, but yeah so and and it's somewhere I want to keep moving into because um there are great examples of medical products and medical robotics etc that are amazing like intuitive surgical does some astounding work for a, a category that I think could otherwise look like anything. Like who, who do you have to choose from amongst all these medical providers? Whereas like you can go to the, the store and pick out an iPhone because you think it looks nice and it, and it fits all your user needs and it does everything you need to. But like if you're a, a doctor or hospital person purchasing medical equipment, I guess there's, there's 
maybe less of a market. I don't know. I could be totally wrong. But what I mean to say is I think there's a lot of room to do some really cool stuff in medical, especially not just with aesthetics, but in, in usability mm -hmm. and, and just making sure that the patient or the person using the product doesn't maybe even feel like a, a sick person, if that's the case. But there's, there's a lot in that field. But yeah, that's, that's somewhere I like to be and somewhere I, I want to do, do more work. That would be awesome because there's so many medical things that are just ugly and antiquated. And <laughs> as, as someone who spent a lot of time in hospitals, <laughs> it, it would be nice to have a, a refresh in some of those things for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, see what else we have. So let's talk about um, the tools that you use, since that's mm -hmm. a big part of every engineer or designer's uh, abilities. Yeah. So you have a yeah. SolidWorks KeyShot and Adobe Suite listed on your profile. Yeah. And actually you might find this too, uh, but there's so many more tools, maybe not software tools, mm -hmm. but tools that are just so vital to our work. Um, for example, I have this great, great box of, of LED lights from Sun LED, where this is something <laughs> I use sometimes. You're probably familiar. Some of them have, have unsoldered, but there's there's buttons here and you can test different size leds take some calipers measure them plot i them need to get that time. that looks awesome oh, uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah I'll, <laughs> I'll hook you up with the the person that sent me this um <laughs> yeah awesome. there's just a zillion a zillion things that are helpful whether it's mold tech books or vdi plaques to to understand what kind of product texture you're you want to go with because there's pros yes. and everything and then of and course yeah, go ahead. And also like making sure that the vendor actually applied the right texture. You need to have mm -hmm. the real sample with you because mm -hmm. I've had that happen. Where <laughs> uh, the thing didn't work like it was supposed to because the texture wasn't right. Yeah. And oh, yeah. I had the plaque and I'm like, mm, does this look the same? No. <laughs> Wild. Yeah. And in illumination and light pipes, I've, I've done some work with light pipes as well. And it's like that's vital getting that that surface polish to the to the T and getting some nice dispersive textures. Yeah. Um, I, I know I'm not scratching the surface of, of everything you do, but like, yeah, no, like, yeah. That encapsulated it. Oh. Cool. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then, yeah, and that's like kind of another thing too with this this theme of just how how I love to work and that's with the client from end to end. So the the ID might, that phase might end, but then there's this this conversation with the, the vendors and the manufacturers and and yes, like checking on the textures so it, it doesn't come back and and look completely opposite of what you intended or it's just wrong for the use case. Like a polished part for some like outdoor speaker makes no sense if if it's gonna get scratched up and stuff. So you want a nice mm -hmm. texture on there. And likewise, textures can maybe take in oils and stuff. So it's really a an important decision that just can't be uh checked and then forgotten about when you ship it. You need to you need to validate everything. Oh gosh, I didn't think yeah. about that, but that it would pick up oils. That's 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 one of those things that like an expert would be thinking about. And you, your first time trying to develop something you wouldn't know. That's cool. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's so much, so much to our world of product development. It's uh it's definitely fun. It's so fun. I have fun. Do you have fun, Erin? I have fun. I love it. Especially getting like just like you, I get to work on totally different things. Everything is a totally new challenge. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm definitely represented in the types of things that you worked on for sure yeah and I love how you're talking too about the branching of these clients you get like they'll see an automotive light and they'll think oh my product is just like that and then their product is like I don't know some something completely different but then the next client you get or any referral sees that and they're like oh wow this fits my needs perfectly and so yes yeah, as, as freelancers we just have so much so much breadth we can do so much yeah. That's so and, great. <laughs> like opposed to being in a corporate job where it's like, oh great, another mm -hmm. another track light for a kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just yeah. a different size. <laughs> yeah. And that's such a funny thing too about, about freelancers, because I think maybe that's the reason why a lot of people go into business on their own because they want to do, they want to do more. And there's there's certainly like that that wisdom to niche down as as designers and engineers, the, the more specific we can get, the more likely a client is to come across us and say, yes, that's exactly who I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But luckily we get to, we get to pick. But we have like multiple 
uh, specialties mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to someone who just works the same job for 15 years and they have they have one specialty or two yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what okay so you're you're an expert in SOLIDWORKS expert key shot and then you, what in adobe suite do you normally use mm -hmm. i use mainly photoshop and illustrator and those are tools for a number of different things whether it's concept development or coming up with the regulatory information under your product like these are all these are all things that i like to do to make sure that every little bit of oh. this design comes through as intended and and uh according to the client vision and so a lot of the any sort of graphics i do will be in these these adobe programs and then and then of course if you need uh visualization marketing materials uh if you if you finished your product and it's not manufactured yet but you need something to show to your customers for pre-orders then we already have the cad let's let's pop it into this sophisticated rendering software make it look real and so then in photoshop you can put a hand in there and do all this movie magic and get something that your clients can use that's really cool that's a great um extra add-on that you can do and since you are a business owner i think that gives us better perspective on what types of things need to be in that marketing material mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially since you've just done all that research on you know their client base and the types of users that are going to be using this and in what situations so you'd be the perfect person to make that material too thanks yeah i enjoy it I, i've done it for it's cool because uh i worked at a consultancy called bold design and that's where where i was part of this this program for the roku express and oh. so we we have rokus here over here too at my house and then every now and then i'd see the the render of this product that i spent like a a day rendering and then photoshopping to perfection just slide across the screen and every time i'd, I'd be like <laughs> And up like hey, I did that. <laughs> that. That's a cool feeling. Yeah, that's yeah. so cool. That's that's always a testament to how how good of a product it is too. If you actually worked on it and then buy it afterwards, because oh, yeah. there's there's some things that I've I've definitely gotten the competitive version of <laughs> mm -hmm. things that I've worked on because I've seen um, inside the machine how that engineering team worked. Uh, but but usually. Uh, the people I work with are aces, so I do like the <laughs> products. But every once in a while, yeah. Uh, Isn't what a else? Funny thing, when when a client like in in the space that you that you live in, um, or like it, with products that you use, a, a competitor comes to you and like, are you honest in that moment when they ask you? Like, I had a client come to me this summer in in a category that I I really enjoy and it's cool to see them, but like my favorite version of that product is their competitors. <laughs> And so they asked me what I thought about it and what was my favorite. I was, I was honest. I mean, there's, there's isn't bad, but, uh, I don't know. I wonder if there's, I wonder if there's like a, a right answer in that, in that question. Oh gosh. Now I'm going to have anxiety. I've never had that situation, but it's possible. Yeah. It happen. <laughs> I guess honesty is, is the best policy no matter what. So I, I'm, I'm confident just say what's, what's on your, what's in your heart. Okay, I'm gonna believe you, Tristan. Yeah, okay. That sounds like a good idea. I think so. <laughs> I think I think that's the best advice on a recorded podcast to give. <laughs> best possible. I'm always but, honest. Yeah. Even I've never I'm... lied. <laughs> Ever. Yeah. Even when I'm blowing smoke up your yeah. Mm -hmm. Um you got another cool product on your portfolio here that looks like it has a solar panel. What is this? Yeah. That's another project that I, I got to work on with the folks over at Informal. Uh, oh, yeah. Informal.cc, the, the freelance collective where they have uh, engineers and mechanical, electrical, graphic designers, industrial designers like myself. Yeah. And this, this product is coming, coming to market very soon. So this is just a 3D print filled with. Oh, water. it's so much bigger yeah. than I thought from the picture. Wow. Yeah. It's, and the reason is because it, it has solar panels on it and it has a top notch uh, driver and tweeter in it. So the, the sound you get from it is, is fantastic. Um, but that also might just be the camera angle. <laughs> is, see how big it is, Aaron? It's huge. <laughs> It's, it's, it's just like eight pounds or so, and this lives outside. It's a completely solar powered speaker conceived of by this, this um, 
uh, person, Clint Stars. And so he, he wanted to have these, these speakers out in his backyard that could be completely solar powered so that he'd never have to run in, grab a charger, grab a Bluetooth speaker, leave it outside. Oh, my speaker's outside. And so um, we launched this on Kickstarter some months ago and it raised a good, I think, 350K between wow. Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Yeah, they did really oh. well. Uh, and they're they're doing some really cool things over there. So this this product uh, in its production form will be shipping soon. And um, this is just one of the prototypes I made to to validate all my engineering and um, industrial design decisions. Wow! And it's kind of cool because I made it so that the front could pop up, <laughs> so that I could put the uh, the uh, face with the the tweeter and the speaker on here. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's one of my favorite parts of, of the job is being able to prototype things like this yeah. and um, just make clever little decisions to save the client cost and so I don't have to make two of these. And So is that watertight? Yes, the actual project product is. Um, I can't, I don't know from the top of my head if you want to throw it in a swimming pool. Uh, <laughs> it is quite highly IP rated. Um, yeah. So is that something that you know how to design for or was that like more of a mechanical engineering part that needed to step in? That's that's an interesting question. And the the short answer is that's like all Sam Holland. He did all the waterproofing <laughs> and developed the really sophisticated gaskets. But the the longer answer is that that's like a, a conversation we have early on. So when I'm developing concepts that we're showing the client, I'm I'm actually also talking to Sam, the mechanical engineer, about the those directions forward and, and getting his input on whether mm -hmm. he thinks that he can actually um, turn this into a product that he can waterproof and that everything can go in the right place. And if he's like, no, I'm I'm a little nervous, then then I'm gonna be like, oh, okay, yeah, let's let's find something that works. Uh, and so right. yeah, it's just that constant dance, that constant ballroom <laughs> dance where we're all all just kind of maneuvering and giving each other some space and then going on the tango and all this thing. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I've only seen seen ballroom dancing on on Netflix. So <laughs> direct me if, if you know the more how it goes. Nope, sounds right. Sounds right to me. So you just mentioned uh that you're you can prototype stuff in in your space that you have all by yourself what kind of tools I mean, do you have for that i see a 3d ooh. printer back there yes uh-huh yeah i'm a big fan of the the prusa printers so mm -hmm. i have two of those over here two uh-huh uh-huh you run them at the same time or are they different resolution yeah yeah no i run them at the same time because sometimes like you want to mm -hmm. you want to feel something and by the end of the day and it might be a, a big part or something so just print cut it up in in cad and print a few different pieces of it and then stick it all together and you have something that you can play with by the end of the day and wow. come up with some decisions on how to move forward. So yeah, it's nice to have a bunch of 3D printers, although you don't need more than one and there's so many services out there. Like I don't have a CNC in my in my home office, but they're like a, an email away and uh, a few days later you get a an aluminum CNC part that you can check for sizing and all this stuff. So it's it's cool in, in the world we live in now where you can send out your CAD and then in a few days, like get a light pipe back and test it out. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any shops in Salt Lake City near you to do that? Or do you have to like get them mailed? I'm working on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on trying to figure out who's who's around out here. I have some leads because I want to, um, I have this idea for a watch brand and Ooh. I've had it for a few years. And so I started making prototypes. It'll basically just re rehouse this classic Casio watch that there is a pretty large fan base for. And so I want to give people more variety, but with the same watch components that they're familiar with. And so I'm, I'm thinking the proper material for that could just be some sort of CNC aluminum. We'll see. But yeah, I'd love to, if any Salt Lake City folks are around with, with leads on CNC shops, would love to chat. Cool. Yeah. And uh, what about your clients? Are they mostly uh, virtual online or are they local at all? Have you found any nearby? It's, yeah, it's a mix. It's a mix. I've been working the, the Salt Lake City scene 
pretty consistently going to a bunch of events because there's some really cool stuff happening over here. And I really want to be a part of that. And so uh, I do have some clients coming up potentially that are in the Salt Lake City area, which is actually handy because one, one project could be this massive, um, this massive injection mold type project. So I'm excited to be able to take some, uh, some of that smooth on two-part epoxy to start prototyping uh, on my porch, this like 10 foot by four foot <laughs> project thing. That's hopefully that's obscure enough to not <laughs> give away what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe too obscure, but, but yeah. Um, so I do, yeah, I do <laughs> want to find more folks local, but then, yeah, it's always a pleasure working with folks, whether they're in Michigan, California, New York, all over. And, and same thing with any, any of the, um, the, the folks that I bring in, if, if there's ever a project that needs subcontractors, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter if they're local. We have FedEx if we need to shoot off any, mm -hmm. any prototypes. I, I'm a big fan of, of working remote and then meeting when, when you need to, but I don't think it's a requirement. Yeah, same yeah. here. Yeah. I, I think what I, when I originally wanted to quit my job and get into freelancing, especially for optical engineering, it was like, absolutely not. You have to be on site hundred percent of the time, you know? And I think, especially with COVID, uh, that mindset has changed a lot for people who work yeah. on physical products. They're a little bit more open to having more time remote because most of the time we're just like playing around on our computers anyway, all alone, like trying yeah. to drown out the noise of other people talking. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, how, how has that been, been for you as maybe people are looking to pull people back in from, from COVID back into the office? Have you noticed a change in your client base, whether they want you in person versus they're okay with you being a hundred miles away? Um, it, that part is the same for me. It's just that there's more work because before, um, during COVID, I couldn't go on site to like go to the lab and see the thing. And usually mm -hmm. whenever I would go on site or whenever we had a more in-depth meeting that would like kickstart off the contract that would, that would cat be a catalyst for actually getting started. And uh -huh. if I don't, if it's just like, yeah, give me a call when you're ready to do this, they're never ready to do this until like the last week. And they're like, okay, well design freeze next week. And it's like, well, now I can't do anything. But before if they, you know, were all coming into the office and I were in that town, I'd be like, well, let me just stop by. And then I would stop by and I would see the thing and the VP would be there and the CEO would be there. And I'd be like, all right, well, now that I see this, here's what I can do. I can do X, Y, Z. And I'd also recommend this. I can write a, up a contract today and the CEO's there and the VP of engineering is there. And they're like, okay, cool. And it gets it done. Mm -hmm. But um, the work itself, I don't think uh, that really hasn't been an issue either way. Wow. But uh, you can you can always travel, and Salt Lake City has a good airport, right? <laughs> sure <it> does. <laughs> fly yeah. out of. It's like <laughs> ten or fifteen minutes from my house too. Everything is so so close here. I flew Salt over Lake. Salt Lake on the way back yeah. from San Francisco, and oh. I took a video, and I was like, "Hi, Tristan." <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Far out. I gotta, I gotta find that way back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It was like nothing, nothing, nothing. What is that? That looks like a lake. Where are we? Oh, it's Salt Lake. Oh, wow. It's pretty yeah. impressive. Sure is. Yeah. It's, it's a funny time to live in Salt Lake city though. There's some, some environmental things looming. So we need to shape up over here if we want to want to keep it the, the city we love, but, um, yeah, oh, wow. TBD. We'll know in a few years. There's there's some uh, arsenic at the bottom of the lake that as as oh, we're no. using, yeah, as the lake starts to evaporate because we're using so much water over here and are in drought conditions. Oh. Uh, at some point in the next few years, that might start to blow into the city. So that's terrifying. We, yeah, yeah. And there's there's some ideas out there, but then there's some folks in the government who are kind of frozen and not really doing anything. That's my understanding of it. But yeah, wow. we got to get our act over here. Wow, I had no idea. That's wild. Yeah. Let, so let me get back into your 
I want to understand how Tristan Pannon works in his head about oh, yeah, uh-huh. like these artistic things that you're doing, the artistic side. Mm-hmm. Are you, you're like, okay, this is, this is a router and routers look like this. So I'm going to make it look like this. Or is it like, this needs to be an updated one. So we're going to make it look like Apple and we're going to round the corners off or um, like, what what is your thought process in trying to come up with the aesthetics? Ah, uh, uh-huh. Good question. I think I think the answer is um, sort of none of the above. It's it's much more of a um, good because uh, I was just pulling that out of my. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be that would have been really cool though if you, if you if you did land on it and we could have just nope. said oh yeah next question yeah we, we got it <laughs> but for so. <laughs> Yeah, my my typical process, and this is always changing, um, and it's an interesting thing being being an independent designer and and building up these processes because kind of back to your statement before, like there's a version of of the profession where you're where you're the muscle. You come in and you do you do what you're told and you do it really well. Um, but then as as independent designers and engineers, we're looking at the big picture. We're looking at budget. We're looking at cost. We're looking at at the time. And so when someone comes to me and if they were to say, uh, I have a router that I want to design, I would likely take them through the, my, my typical outline of phase one strategy, phase two concept development, phase three concept refinement, phase four design finalization, and then there might be some uh, supporting phases later on. There could also be if it's if it's a router and we have to do something special, say, say it's like a wearable instead, we might do mm. some other phases of, of UX studies, of user experience to make sure it's comfortable, it's intuitive before we even start to concept. We wanna get that product or component architecture ready. Um, but but back to, to your question where rather than saying, this is the answer, the industrial design process removes other answers. Mm. So this this exploration and, and looking out into everything you can do, rather than just saying, I want to do that, you say, these won't work because of this, these won't work because of this, these won't work because of this. And by the end of that, you have something that you can say, we thought of everything, this is the best answer. And so sometimes like that's something you don't even, you wouldn't even have, have thought early on, but it's it's uh, it's more reductive than just building something from the ground up. Yeah. You're kind of chipping away at that marble to reveal your Michelangelo, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever comes, Pinocchio. Yeah. yeah. To find your Pinocchio. Yeah. There you go. Uh-huh. So if, uh, if cost was one of the bigger um, constraining factors that a customer came with you with, what would be some of the things you'd do? Like uh, we reduce the number of parts in the assembly. Um, would there be other things that you'd be like, this would be nice if you had money, but now I would say we can't do this? Uh-huh. Yeah. I think, yeah, 100%. If there's if they're worried about cost in manufacturing, then yeah, part reduction is great. We can choose more cost-effective materials. We can choose directions that we know are, are feasible that an engineer can have a lot of confidence in. On the other hand, there's there's versions of this where we can make a really groundbreaking product if we if we take a chance on this this thing we have yet to validate. But at some point, like maybe that'll be kind of expensive and maybe worth it. But yeah, if cost is a factor, then we can totally um, work around that. There is there is a version too though where you just you can't do industrial design at a certain price point. Um, mm-hmm. And I've, I've thought about this a little bit in terms of pizza. Mm-hmm. And so um, say you want some pizza, you have a few options. You can go to the store and get a Lunchable. That's pizza. You can take home a DiGiorno. That's pizza. Maybe a, the next step up is like a, you order from like a nice place that has great sourdough crust. That's pizza. And then maybe the final, version of this pizza analogy you go to like a a super delicious restaurant and michelin you, five star oh yeah yeah <laughs> and you order the margarita and chow down and it has caviar on it yeah, yeah. Oh, there's everything on it ice cream caviar oh 
gold. Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> of course, so maybe gold. That's, yeah. <laughs> At that point, maybe, yeah. In this industrial design analogy, maybe that's, unless your clients like Louis Vuitton, maybe it's not too appropriate, but yeah, you can get pizza. Like if you want industrial design, you can get industrial design, but do you want the Lunchable as your pizza? <laughs> and if you do, yeah, maybe you do. Like maybe, maybe you do. Maybe you're designing a kazoo and Lunchable pizza is fine for that. But say you're designing like a, a next generation webcam or a next generation smartwatch. I think you might want something a little more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And so when then when it comes to like budgets and, and timelines, then that's all affected. So maybe if your your budget's a bit more constrained, we can work around it. Maybe I have a someone who would be great for you that I know, or maybe maybe we figure out what's what's more important for your business at the time and and go in that direction and connect again when you're ready to invest more in the ID. So there's, yeah. The, yeah. I, did, I didn't mean so much uh, not paying you what you're worth, but more like the manufacturing cost if they didn't have a lot for that um, part. Yeah, um, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm just but, too, but yeah, too also that. focusing in on that. Yeah, I'm sure you <laughs> have the same thing. And yeah, I, that's, that's an interesting point just in terms of a freelance. I like have yet to establish a, a minimum project rate, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's to my de detriment or not. But like, I, I like, I kind of like those small projects too, where they just have these really interesting ideas and we can just noodle on it for a few weeks and then crank out something that they're happy with, that they can go show investors, they can come back later and be a really great client. So I don't know. Have you have you had any success with either establishing a minimum rate or a minimum project um, fee versus uh, just being open to anything? Well, the minimum is my like ninety minute I think consultation that uh -huh. I have. So yeah. when people are like, "Oh, I only have you know a thousand dollars. Can you do mm -hmm. an optical design from start to finish? And can you do it in a week?" Like, no, absolutely not. But we can <laughs> we can mm -hmm. look what at what you have now and what you can do on your own and we can talk through that and usually that's what all they're looking for anyways and really all that they can afford with their budget and and with their time budget you know mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. uh, a week isn't really going to be enough time for me to just you know like i'll have the simulation built to start but then that's step one and then i have to do the design so i guess that would be my minimum but for like an actual project where i'm doing a design um i usually do have to set minimum amounts because i don't constantly have optical engineering software i only lease it when i need it so your stuff is expensive yeah <laughs> uh -huh. it's pretty nuts so uh -huh. I mean, if it were like, you know, ZMAX is only like, what, three grand a year or something, but um, oh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if oh. it were something like that, then I could take on the little projects, but otherwise, if I'm not currently leasing software, then I do have a minimum so that it makes it worth it because otherwise I could be in the hole mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I had projects during uh, 2020, 2021, when I was doing, when I first did the pilot for Odd Engineer, and they wanted something longer, but mm -hmm. it wasn't going to be enough money to like pay for the software and pay for, I needed a new machine also at that point. So I, I needed like at least 15 grand just to cover the expenses. I was like, no, I'm not, I can't do a $2,000 project for you, dude. Yeah. <laughs> not totally. possible. But I do, I, I love doing those when I have the software already and I have a gap in my schedule. I also just like you, I love to be able to do those things. I just can't financially always do them. Yeah. That's such a, an interesting discipline question almost as a, as a freelancer, like, you know, yeah. it's, it could be detrimental to your business health to, to help that one great founder out who, who's looking for funding. But at the same time, you're like, this probably isn't the best financial decision. Um, yeah. But minimums make, make total sense. I hope, I hope maybe this year, I can get to something like that. Maybe it's in your book. Do you talk about your book? <laughs> it was more about branding. That that okay. guidebook is is all about building a name for yourself. Um, 
let's talk about speaking of branding let's talk about your rebrand to mystery huh? form huh? mysteryform.com oh, yeah. that's your yes. company uh-huh, and uh-huh. you have some i love how you have these um frequently asked questions on oh. on your home page what do industrial Thank designers you. do what is <laughs> that methodical design how long does it take i'm sure a lot of these questions come up a lot don't they yeah and i think maybe those those responses could use some more love but yeah it's those those seem to be some common questions and just some some things i wanted to differentiate myself from kind of early out for any any client who comes by because the work i like to do i found i worked with a a coach named Michael Turwent who does growth marketing. And so we had a few months of, of calls and I got to chat with him about where I wanted to go as a business and, and what made me different from other industrial designers to, to try to make my business more healthy and uh, just have more fun with what I'm doing. And we, we realized that the, the work that I like to do requires a, a client who cares about their customers. Mm-hmm. So if, if, you, if you are a client who, who's stoked to make something, because you think you can solve this problem and affect people's lives in this positive way. And you wanna give people this, this sense of magic that you're getting from this and, and you want those people to be happy. That's, that's who I like to work with. There's a version of, of someone who has a, a business idea. They've found this unaddressed market and they want to capitalize and make money off of that. And that's- that's Try the Bugatti. Yeah. They're yeah. dreaming about their car that they're gonna get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's like, that's, that's fine. Um, but that's, that's a much different conversation because when I'm telling them like, Hey, you don't want to leave this edge, like super sharp here. Like, I know you want to look just like, like this, like edgy product that you've referenced, but like uh-huh. people are going to cut themselves on that or, or something like that. There's some very real implications <laughs> of, of physical design. Like you might have a, an affordance where you stick your hand in and you drop the thing and it breaks your fingers. And they're like, let them bleed, break their fingers. I don't care. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, <gotta. laughs> yeah. I brought a, I brought an example um, that, that is always on my mind because you asked about horror stories and I didn't, I didn't work on this screwdriver case, but <laughs> I have hurt myself on it so many times. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yes. Probably good to just, just get it out there. It's from Milwaukee. They do great oh. stuff. But, oh no, uh, not Milwaukee. Yeah. I know, I know. I love Milwaukee. Um, I don't love this case though, because too many times you you go to open it and then do you see this this uh opening here? Yes. Yeah, check out what happens when I have my fingers in it and I go to shut it. Oh, 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 oh yeah, I've pinched myself on there. And the less skin you get in there, even worse, until maybe you might even just cut yourself. Oh gosh, yeah. No. And so that's, that's like the, the funny thing too, going back to ID, like you want to be thoughtful, you want to be methodical. And if you just go to someone and say, Hey, I want these sketches. I want to make a cool product. And you get Mm -hmm. sketches for this product and you're like, bam, that's awesome. Engineer it, produce it, ship it out. That's, that's not where I live. I live in like, oh yeah, this is one concept. Let's, let's take a look at it. Let's 3D print it. And then maybe after after a few hours of 3D printing and designing, we look at the print and we're like, oh shoot, this is a we don't want to hurt people. Let's not do this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then that's, that's where I like to be. And if the client's like, Oh, great point. I don't want to hurt my customers. So I want to, I want to be with clients who, who care. That makes a lot of sense with your personality. And then they're also going to be stoked about the same things that you're stoked about and looking to maximize the same things that your brain is already like working towards. Yeah. If we align on like passion and excitement, that's wild. Like that's wonderful. Like that's a yeah. good thing to be. Cause that's, that's like the fuel behind every, every design really. And that's what I'm, I'm talking to my, my workshop participants about too. I want to keep this brief of the emergency radio loose enough that they can identify the place that they're passionate about and go all in. One of the participants is really into home goods and wants to make like a really nice at home radio. And like, if he, if he can run on that, and that's awesome versus saying like, oh, make something that you keep in your closet like 100% of the year and it has to look rugged because it's an emergency radio. Then that's like kind of forwarding <laughs> the process. So yeah, when you get that alignment and you're just fired up about the same things, magic happens. So with your workshop, are they, are your students actually going to have like 
the physical thing at the end do they have 3d printers or um is that something that you can help them up with yeah yeah i think what i really want to do this would be my ideal situation is that any any of the participants in the course can take this this project show it to the business or consultancy or corporation of their choice and get a a great response from those hiring managers and maybe find their either their next gig or just have fun with it now so that's that's the end goal to have something that can take them on their next step in their career um and maybe that maybe that includes some 3d prints at the end um but my my hypothesis is more so that it includes the process so we we talked about strategizing and then developing these concepts and and cutting away at the everything else and so that's that's what I'm I'm mainly doing. And then mm -hmm. if they can get something that's made, that's great. But if it just turns out to be a render, then that's fine too. Yeah. What you're talking about here sounds a lot like it, or at least it reminds me of what uh, Mech Labs is doing. MechLabs.ai. Uh -huh. Have you heard of them? It's a <clears throat> kind of affiliated with Circuit Launch. It's a separate company, but it's the same people over at Circuit Launch. You've been uh -huh. there, right? When you were back in the Bay no. Area, no, no, I missed oh. out. Oh, um, Circuit Launch is an electronics co-working space in Oakland. And when I was just back in San Francisco, I went through and did a live tour, which is really cool because I think back in 2018, I did a tour for Solid Smack of them when they were like a baby, and now they're much bigger. But they oh. are doing so. MechLabs.ai is their idea of how can we get people who want to get into hardware design and maybe they're software engineers, or maybe they're totally new to engineering. How can they get practical skills without having to go back and get a master's degree or, mm -hmm. or get a bachelor's degree in something totally mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. And their idea is that you want practical hands-on experience, which is exactly what you're talking about. Like let's work through the whole thing. And then you'll not only get those skills, but you'll be able to demonstrate that you have those skills at the end because you have like mm -hmm. a real thing to show off. Yeah. And I wonder if there's uh -huh. any synergy there where you could maybe work with them because I don't think they have anyone on the industrial design side, but I they're they're mostly doing like robotics, um, circuit building and stuff. Too cool. And, uh -huh. and I think they ask people to if they want to come up with their own project. Uh -huh. They're like all right, if you want to build a circuit board to do this, you can tell us what the project is instead of us saying, here are the projects you can choose from. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that could be really cool if you offered that as well. Um, I don't know. Maybe you guys could work together somehow. That would be really neat. Yeah, I'll, I'll check them out after the call and, and maybe you could put me in touch. If absolutely, you're, still, if you're absolutely. still your baby. I love them. Yeah. Um. So if people were interested in getting in on that workshop, it sounds like you're just sort of piloting it now. Would there be yeah. any way to get more information about like a future run of it? Oh yeah. Yeah. The, Do you have I, a website for it or anything? <laughs> I or have a this... domain name for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's called, it's called powernap.design. Powernap? Yeah. I, I maybe should have thought more about it because. I think it's I think... very catchy. Thanks. But I've, I've heard it makes people sleepy. They'll Does go it? to, yeah, they'll go to work on some of the tasks for the, for the week. And then they'll see the word power nap and think, oh, wow, I got it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe not the best usability decision, but my, my thought was, I liked how catchy it was because I love power naps. And then I thought it was a great, maybe metaphor for these 12 weeks of going through this kind of short, shorter time span to develop a product. But like seeing some very uh, rewarding type things afterwards. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of a power nap, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but otherwise they can just reach out to me at, at Tristan at mysteryforum.com um, okay. and, and then say they're interested. And then I'm, I'd really be stoked if this became something I did a few times a year and got people to, to where they want to be in their career or just give someone some creative freedom if they're if they're locked away at a corporate job if if that's the case i'm sure corporate jobs can be great too uh and then yeah just keep having fun with it so yeah if, 
anyone wants to jump in or learn more, then that's my email. That I would love it if you had more sort of educational material and maybe if you were even able to record those classes at some point, mm -hmm. that would be so cool to be able to like see inside of it, especially for people who are like, I'm thinking about it, but I don't know if I want to invest that much time and energy to just mm -hmm. like peek inside and see. Yeah. I, and, takeaways. Yeah. And maybe we can chat about this more at some point, but I'd love to see how I could make it either free or affordable for students because school costs so much and um, be kind of wild to jump into the mix of all these educational courses and classes and just be like a, a bite-sized version of that. I'd rather kind of be something completely different. So if there's any way to make, make uh, some kind of compensation from it so that I can do it more rather than doing um, work that, that pays, I'd love to consider that. I thought like a magazine would be cool. Uh, maybe in the future. Like my first goal is to just help these, these participants get where they want to be. But then I was thinking it would be kind of lovely, just like um, one of my friends, Sushant, did a magazine. I don't know where it is, but he did a magazine of all, all of his renders and work. And I just had such a fun time looking through it and holding it there in my hand. So I thought it'd be so cool if maybe people could do the same thing for the, the work in the course and see a specific industrial designer's thought process over a few pages and then see a few pages later, someone doing the same prompt, but thinking completely differently. Yeah. It sounds cool to cool. me. I'm the audience. I'm the one and only <laughs> audience. But maybe, maybe there's an opportunity like that. Coffee table book. It would yeah. have lots of cool visuals. Yeah, sure would. You can see their thought process is being different by the different uh, form it takes. The the mysterious mystery form that it takes. Ooh, uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. the mystery form. Yeah, that's that's kind of the idea. And back to your point about the rebrand, the the name mystery form comes from that that feeling when you're developing a product that you know you're gonna get somewhere, but what is this form? Who is that Pokemon, this silhouette of a form that you see in your mind's eye, and then a few weeks later it is realized as a as a real thing that you can now produce? Yeah. I thought that was a cool thing to capture. Mind-blowing. I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, is there anything else that you can share to people out there who might be interested in learning more from you or getting help in their industrial design besides talk to Tristan as early as you can? <laughs> yeah, for, for all the clients out there, uh, book a call with me. For all the designers out there, book a call with me. Just, uh, <laughs> yeah, just just hit me up and um, and let's let's see what your individual needs are. There's, there's like no, no blanket advice, I think, for any sort of, of client. Um, everyone's doing something differently. And, and that means that what I'm going to do for your product is going to be different from what I did for the last person's product. And so, yeah, let's, let's get those conversations going and, and unearth the questions that you need to be asking and get you to something that you can send out to your customers and they'll love it. Awesome. Okay, so if anyone wants to contact Tristan, you can go to oddengineer.com. He's one of the listed engineers there, or you can go to his company website, mysteryform.com, and connect to him there. And you can book appointments on both sites directly with Tristan, and you can actually have a video call. So it's not just a call call. It's a one-on-one, mm. -on -one, mm. kind of face-to-face, -face, but not physically. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, video preferred so we can throw products up in the air and and talk about talk about things yes yeah well thank you so much for your time today tristan it was great hearing about how you do your work and all the different projects you're involved in i didn't even know that you're doing this educational stuff on the side i can't wait to hear more about that and see that expand so congratulations to all your success and i 
hope that this brings you even more clients and students after we publish Thank this you. podcast. Yeah. And, and likewise, thanks again for, for having me on. It was so much fun. And, and I, I've said this before, but thanks so much for everything you do for the, the hardware community, putting out these Aww. podcasts and, and getting people together and, and connecting uh, professionals to clients. You're, you're making the world smaller in a good way. And, and uh, we're, all, we're all better for it. So thanks so much, Erin. Oh, that's sweet of you. <laughs> thanks again, Tristan. All right, take care. Bye-bye. You can find this podcast episode, episode number eight on oddengineer.com, plus a whole bunch of other episodes from different hardware engineering experts. Also on oddengineer.com, you can search the directory a whole bunch of different ways to find the exact specific niche hardware engineering expert you need for your hardware development project. One of those people is Tristan Kanan, so you can contact him directly there, or you can even immediately book an appointment with him and other engineers. Thanks for listening.